though there are wider trees and taller trees, General Sherman in the Sequoia National Park in California contains more wood in its trunk than any other tree on Earth. It's estimated to be 2,200 years old. That's an old tree. It stands 275 feet tall, and it's over 36 feet in diameter. On TripAdvisor, you can get on a TripAdvisor, people comment on the experience of seeing the tree face-to-face, -face, or face-to-tree, I suppose you say, uh, and they say things like this. It is, it is mind-numbingly large. Its massive girth is impressive and unreal. So many incredible trees to see, yet none match this one. It's too big to fathom. For the last few weeks, we've been studying the names of God in the Old Testament, names and designations used for God. In week one, we talked about the word. It's not really a name. It's the word Elohim, the generic word for God. We looked at Genesis 1, 1, and 2, that God is before creation, God is over creation, God is in creation. And then in subsequent weeks, we've been going back, taking compound names for God that use that name Elohim, or the shortened form El, the singular form El, and we've looked at different compound names. For example, we looked at El Elyon, God Most High, in Genesis 14. Last week, we looked at El Roi, the God who sees, in Genesis 16. And this week, we come to another compound name for God, El Shaddai, God Almighty, in Genesis chapter 17. Big stuff demands that we reposition, recalibrate our hearts around the reality of a bigger God. We've been through some big stuff over the last week. Big stuff demands that we reposition, recalibrate our hearts around a bigger God. Whether our challenges are personal, and we all experience these things, whether our challenges are societal, your faith in God really doesn't make much of a difference until you move farther down the path of acknowledging his greatness and, again, resitu resituating your heart according to his greatness. Big stuff calls for a bigger God. Let me encourage you to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17, we're going to spend a few minutes reflecting on the first eight verses of Genesis 17 inasmuch as they help us to understand the significance of that name El Shaddai. We're going to dig into that name El Shaddai, what it means, and then before we close, we'll make a few applications for ourselves. I'm going to begin by reading the entirety of these eight verses. You'll find the verses on the screen. You can also follow along in your Bible. Genesis chapter 17 beginning in verse 1 through verse 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. There it is, El Shaddai. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Verse 4, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, going all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible, I mean, here we're only in chapter 17, so we're not going back very far. From the very beginning, God had a plan to redeem the world from the ravages of sin. God had a plan after the very first moment when, when humanity, Adam and Eve, turned away from the goodness of God and instead uh, succumbed to the temptation to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil— from the very beginning, God had a plan to redeem the world from bondage to sin. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, 
as God is parsing out judgment and curses upon humanity because of their transgressions, even upon the serpent. The Lord speaks these words to the serpent, who is in the text there like the, the embodiment of evil within the world, the personification of evil. He, he says to the serpent, I will put enmity, literally hatred, enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, the serpent's offspring, and, the, and her offspring. And he, speaking of the the woman's offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's this promise from the very beginning of Genesis that from the line of the woman, a human, a person, a human will come who will crush underfoot evil within the world. There's a promise of a, of a human deliverer who will come. That's chapter 3 of the Bible from the very beginning. And then in chapter 12, the, the focus gets narrower as in chapter 12, God calls Abram from the land of Ur of the Chaldees to come to, to leave Genesis chapter 12. He's 75 years old. Go from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to the land that I will show you, God says. And God tells Abram, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He says in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. Him who dishonors you, I will curse. And then God says to Abram, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 3, God had a plan to crush evil underfoot. It was going to come through a human deliverer. Genesis chapter 12, we have more clarity that that deliverer is going to come from the line of Abram. Through Abram's line, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. The promise was never just for one people group, for one nation. It was for all the families of the earth. And then in Genesis chapter 15, you see, God had made promises to Abram and then in Genesis 15, there's this formal covenant that God enters into with Abram. Formal covenant in which God makes promises, very specific promises. He makes promise of relationship. He says to Abram that he will be Abram's God, and not just Abram's God, but, the, but he will be the God of Abram's descendants. He's going to develop this personal relationship. He was going to be Abram's God. Relationship and then descendants. He promises Abram in Genesis 15 that he's going to give to Abram, who, by the way, is a really old guy married to a woman who can't have kids. He's going to give to Abram descendants as countless as the stars in the sky. Relationship descendants, and then he promises land. He's going to give to Abram and his descendants the land of Canaan to dwell in. This is what we call oftentimes the Abrahamic covenant. Now, in a covenant, each party that enters into the agreement, in a covenant, each party has obligations. They have responsibilities. And if the party does not fulfill his obligations then by not fulfilling those, those obligations, they invite curses upon themselves. So in Genesis chapter 15, this is, this is very graphically visualized as, this is the PG-13 part, the bodies of animals are severed and placed in two lines to symbolize the kind of consequences that will come upon the party that fails to fulfill its part of the covenant. Very graphic. The consequences that will come upon the one who does not fulfill his obligations. Now, normally in a covenant, both sides would agree. These are the consequences. Then in Genesis chapter 15, God does something remarkable. He puts Abram to sleep. Abram doesn't go to sleep. He's not bored. No, God puts him to sleep. And then God himself in the form of a smoking pot and a flaming torch, God himself passes through these animal parts, taking upon himself exclusive responsibility to fulfill the terms of the covenant, irrespective of Abraham. God is going to do this himself, irrespective of Abraham. This is why later, generations later, 
In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew, this Jewish author, looks back on Abraham, looks back on the promises made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and Genesis chapter 15, and in the text of Genesis 17 this morning. Matthew's going to look back on all of that. He's going to look back on uh, what, what God had promised and, and recounting the genealogy, the, 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 the heritage of Jesus. He traces Jesus' line all the way back to Abram. You see, not only is Jesus the, 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 the seed of the woman, the, the human being who would come to crush evil underfoot, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Jesus is the, the one who, who comes and fulfills these, this covenant that God has established, who bears upon himself the consequences even of Abraham's disobedience and of our disobedience. He's the one through whom, according to Genesis 12, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Well, this is the plan, God's plan of redemption. And yet Abram and Sarai, going back to uh, our text, Abram and Sarai, they struggled to embrace it. They struggled to embrace it. Of course, we've got to give them a little slack here. I mean, he was really old and she wasn't able to have children. Of course, they had a hard time embracing it. These were irreconcilable circumstances. We talked about this last week. Abram thought that the promises perhaps would be filled through Eliezer, the, the, the manager of his household. God said, no, it's going to come from you, Abram. And, of course, Sarai thought that perhaps it was Hagar, through Hagar, that the promises could be fulfilled. And she tried to take matters into her own, own hands. And, of course, she made a huge mess of that. You see, this was big stuff for an old man and an old woman who couldn't have children to have a baby. This is big stuff. And so as Genesis chapter 17 opens, Abram is 99 years old. He's been living in the land for 24 years, waiting for the fulfillment of the words that the Lord had spoken earlier. He'd left home and household. He'd left land. He'd left everything behind to go to this place. He didn't know where he was going. For 24 years, he's waiting for the fulfillment. Ishmael, by this point, is 13 years old. And in the middle of these impossible circumstances... God having said, yet even still you will have a son. God appears to Abram and again reaffirms the very same promises that he's made before. The promises of relationship, the promises of descendants and of land. He makes the same promises and then he calls himself, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless, he says. El Shaddai. Scholars like to debate what the meaning of the name is, and I'm going to give you uh, what, what I think it means, where it comes from. The word Shaddai probably comes from an Akkadian word, Shadu, meaning mountains. El Shaddai. If so, then there's something about the formidable nature of mountains, the greatness of mountains that is reflected in the name El Shaddai. God is imperishable unyielding, enduring, immovable, just like a mountain, God is immovable. In the words of the psalmist, the heavens and the earth will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, but you stay the same and your years have no end. Kilimanjaro, which you see there on the screen, is the tallest mountain on the continent of Africa the highest freestanding peak in the world. It's only three degrees south of the equator in Africa, so you kind of assume that, you know, because it's hot all the way around the mountain, you'd assume that it's hot on top of the mountain, but it's not so. In fact, on the top of the mountain, the mountain is covered with glaciers. And from any direction, this huge, formidable, imposing presence of the mountain is unmistakable. It just doesn't move. Only the formidable, unyielding, enduring God can make promises and keep promises. Not just to Adam and Eve to crush the head of the serpent through the line of the woman. 
not only to Abram and Sarai, that they would give birth to a son, and through Abram's line, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, but even to us today, that God, through Abram's line, would bring a deliverer who would deliver us from the power of sin. That is the character of El Shaddai, God Almighty. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, El Shaddai, or sometimes just Shaddai, is used with similar meaning some other places. For, I think it's very curious that, in fact, this is one of the, over half of the uses of Shaddai in the Old Testament are, occur in the book of Job. Job is such an interesting book. Job and his friends in the book of Job, are, 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 they spend most of the book questioning God's purposes. They're trying to understand why is Job suffering? And finally, towards the end of the book, they're silenced. Job and his friends are silenced by the revelation of God's formidable and inexplicable power. In the book of Ruth, Naomi. You remember Naomi? Naomi uh, was an Israelite who went off into the land of Moab. She had a husband and two sons. She goes out into the land of Moab, and her, uh, her, her husband dies, and her two sons die, and she comes back with... Well, with one of the two Gentile uh, daughters-in-law, when she reaches uh, Bethlehem there in the book of Ruth, she attributes her bitter experiences to Shaddai. You see, she knows the mysterious power of God. She knows the, the justice of God. She can't explain it. She just knows that somehow all of this has to make sense. But she doesn't get it. Another occurrence of this same name, El Shaddai, is uh, strangely in the, in the story of, of uh, Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24, uh, when Balak, the Midianite, the Gentile king, wants to curse the Jews, the Israelites, as they make their way through the wilderness, this Midianite king, Balaam, hires a prophet named Balaam, a, a, a Gentile prophet named Balaam, to draw curses down upon the Israelites. And there's Balaam the prophet up on the mountain. And time after time, Balak says to Balaam, curse them, curse them. And, and every time that Balaam tries to curse the Israelites, what comes out? Blessing. Blessing. Why? Because Balaam says, I have seen the vision of Shaddai. God Almighty has a plan which is immovable. I cannot change that plan. El Shaddai, God Almighty, is formidable, unyielding, unbending, enduring. He does not fail, and we ought not trifle with him. What he says he will do, whether we like it or not. That's his prerogative, because he's El Shaddai, God Almighty, sovereign God over all things. Big stuff calls for a bigger God. Big stuff calls for a bigger God. Let me ask you this morning, in light of the circumstances in your life or in our community, how big is your God? Is he big enough for you to trust him even when you don't understand him? Let me ask that again because that is a very relevant question. In all of our lives, a lot of times. Is your God big enough that you would trust him even if you don't understand what he's doing? You see, what you believe about God will affect the way that you live your life. A few questions to contemplate before we close. A few questions related to El Shaddai. Number one, will you fall on your face before him? Abram and Sarai had tried to take matters into their own hands with the story of Eliezer, the, uh, the, 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 the manager over the household, with the story of Hagar, the, uh, the, servant, the, the maid servant of, 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 of Sarai. But in every attempt, every attempt to circumvent the prerogative of God, God's prerogative to do what God wants to do when God wants to do it, every attempt to circumvent the prerogative of God to fulfill his promises in his way, in his time, always ended up failing miserably. You see, the only truly genuine response 
to El Shaddai is to fall on your face before him and to say, you are God and I am not. You are God and I am not. Let me ask you this morning, as as we come face to face with El Shaddai, are you willing to fall on your face before him? Secondly, are you willing to yield control to him? Again, Job and his friends through the book of Job try to understand Job's suffering. They question everything from Job's righteousness, like, Job, maybe you're not as good as you thought you were. Maybe that's why this is coming on you. They question Job's righteousness to even God's goodness. Maybe God's not as good as we thought he was. Until finally the book climaxes at the very end of the book with Job's repentance. And he doesn't repent for like the kind of things that we would think a person would repent for. What he repents for is that he'd spoken of things that he did not understand. He'd spoken as if he understood God. You see, the hugeness of El Shaddai demands that eventually we come to the place where we relinquish control over circumstances and we relinquish control over the need to understand Will you yield control to him and acknowledge the fact that El Shaddai understands? El Shaddai, God Almighty, is able to make sense of it all, even when you don't. And then third, will you hide yourself in him? Will you hide yourself in him? I love the way that the psalmist puts together these beautiful names of God in Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, that's El Elyon, he who dwells in the shelter of El Elyon, God Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That's El Shaddai. You see, if you've fallen on your face before him, if you've relinquished control over the need to know and and, and understand all things, then you're going to trust him even when things don't make sense. You're going to trust him even when you don't understand him. Can you trust him when you don't understand him? Can you trust him when you don't understand him? Spurgeon writes, Spurgeon was that Baptist pastor from a couple hundred years ago. He writes, those who dwell in the secret place of the Almighty are shielded by him. What a shade in the day of noxious heat. Have you experienced any noxious heat in your life? I'm not talking about Phoenix. (laughs) Have you experienced any noxious heat in your life? What a shade in the noxious heat God is. What a refuge in the hour of deadly storm. The more closely we cling to El Shaddai, God Almighty, the more confident we may be. Think for a moment about the most dubious things in your life, the area in which you have the most questions. Think for a moment about the most terrifying things in your life. Big stuff calls for a bigger God. Big stuff calls for a bigger God. There's a difference between a microscope and a telescope. A microscope is used to make small things appear bigger, right? You take small things, put it under the microscope so that they appear bigger. But a telescope is used to make big things look as big as they are. A telescope is used to see big things. And as believers in El Shaddai, We're called to be telescopes, not microscopes. We don't take our little small God and try to make him look bigger than he is. No, friends, our God is huge. And we're trying to show him off as as big as he really is. Our commitment to fall on our face before him, our commitment to relinquish control to him, to say, I may not understand it, but I trust you even still, our, our, our commitment to hide ourselves in him. Friends, in a week like this, in any week in which we walk through difficult times, I, I got to believe that as believers in El Shaddai, as those who trust El Shaddai, our ability to do just that, fall on our face before him, yield control to him, hide ourselves in in him, this is our greatest contribution to society. I love the bake sales. I love the different things around the, I, I live in Highland Park. I love the way that our community is active in responding. Yet I gotta believe that this is my greatest contribution, to fall on my face before him, to yield control to him, and to hide myself in him.
He is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. Big stuff calls for a bigger God. How big is your God this morning? Oh God, we give great thanks to you because we come before you acknowledging that you are huge. And though we may not necessarily understand you, we may not understand why things happen in the world the way that we would want them to happen, yet God, we, we as a posture of faith, fall on our face before you. We relinquish control to you and we say, God, hide us in you. We praise you that you have purchased that right to become the children of God through the death of Christ upon the cross. God, let us take joy in that and let the peace of God pervade our hearts and minds in whatever situations we may find ourselves in. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.